How are we doing? So uh, I wanted to go over a concept here uh, that comes up in a lot of the AOPS books. Um, it's summarized, I think this is a paraphrase, of don't memorize but understand. What do we mean by that? Like why, why can't we just memorize formulas and things like that without understanding? And so I'll read to you a passage from the intro to uh, volume one, The Basics. You guys might benefit sometimes from reading these forwards and things like that. There's interesting info in there and it'll give you a more holistic approach when you tackle the book itself. So this is from volume one. Um, it says, this book is about methods. If you find yourself memorizing formulas, you are missing the point. The formulas should become obvious to you as you read without need of memorization. This is another function of the examples and exercises to make the methods part of the way you think, not just some process you can remember. Okay, that's uh, you know kind of the way they state it. There might be some place where it actually literally says, don't memorize, understand. But I do think they bring it up in all of their books in some capacity. And so uh, we wanna get into that today. And I wanna demonstrate it by going over a problem and show you how if we understand what's happening in the usage of a formula, then we can use that to adapt to future problems. And that brings me to another point before we get started here. On my Discord server, uh, we recently had a conversation in there about how the older AMC tests are easier um, and no noticeably easier. So you might find yourself getting a pretty high score on the 2012 or 2007 or something like that, but it's much harder to get a similar score in the modern era. And so we were focused on why that might be. And uh, I had given an answer on there that I wanna share with you here. Um, I said, I have always suspected, but obviously cannot prove, Reed speculated, that one of their goals is the advancement of mathematics in society, culture, the world. Mathematics, like science, is always seeking to advance the ball to move forward, to accomplish new things. Mathematicians like to challenge themselves and the community to make progress. The students coming through the pipeline today need to be able to solve the problems of the future. So even the older tests seem easy for us in the modern era. They were hard for them though. E easy because once the concept broke through into the consciousness of the mainstream school level competition math community, it was then used by tons of mock testers, curriculum creators, textbook writers, etc. People discussed it in all kinds of forums. It became less cutting edge and more common knowledge. So my thinking, and this is just my opinion, I have not, I'm not privy to any of their private discussions. Uh, this is just a guess. Is the MAA committee that takes on the creation of the test never wanted a test that can be mastered by memorizing past concepts. They have always wanted to push the boundary of the mathematical frontier. They want people who advance to be those who can adapt. Life in mathematics is not about merely repeating past learned processes. Any monkey can do that or a rat in a maze. Rather, it's taking those past processes and adapting to the challenges of the future. If you can't adapt under the pressure of time, they don't want you to advance too far in the competition, okay? So that's an opinion, okay? I think that might be something along those lines is going on. I would love to be a part of their meeting, uh, but I'm not. And so uh, we don't know all of their motives when they design the test and what they're trying to accomplish. This is just a suspicion that I have. And that's why when you're taking a test now, it seems harder than the old ones, but back then it was hard for them at that time because those ideas had not permeated the consciousness of the community at that time. And so I wanna get into how this plays a role in this problem here. So here we go, don't memorize, understand. We're gonna use the basis of this as the 2008 AMC 10B problem number 17. A poll shows that 70% of all voters approve of the mayor's work. On three separate occasions, a pollster, so there's three occasions, a pollster selects a voter at random. What is the probability that on exactly one of these three occasions, the voter approves. We just want one of these three. The voter approves of the mayor's work. And if you know what we're gonna use here, as some of you do, some of you might not, what we're gonna be using is uh, called binomial probability. Okay, and so I'll write that here. Binomial meaning there's gonna be two outcomes. And you would use this whenever there's two outcomes, okay? Uh, locally in the schools here, this topic is sometimes covered in an Algebra 2 honors course or even regular, it depends on the teacher and the book. 
uh, the, the school district. It's also sometimes, but not always, covered. Well, it's covered usually, I believe, in um, pre-calc for sure. I, I think, but you can, I can't guarantee. I don't know exactly what the standards are, but it's in there for sure. So anyhow, binomial probability, how does it work? Let's say I want, there's N trials with K successes. Okay, case successes. What a weird word. Um, and then there's going to be the probability of success is equal to P. Now, in probability, the sum of the probabilities has to add to 1. So the probability of failure would be 1 minus P. P being some value between 0 and 1 inclusive. Okay, so then uh, how would this work? The formula looks like this n choose k uh, times the probability of success to the power of k and then the probability of failure 1 minus p to the n minus k okay now this is the formula and if you just memorize this you would probably be able to apply it to any situation that has exactly two outcomes Let's see why it works though. This is the part that we want to get to, the understanding, okay? We don't just want to see this and be able to apply it. You want to understand why it works. This is why they stress this. Let's see it. Okay, so let's say that I've got in this problem here, we want three separate occasions. So there's three trials. I want one success, one of these three. My probability, what does it say? 70% of all voters approve. So that's seven out of 10. That's the chance of success, if you will. So you could put 0 0.7. Looking at the answers, I see decimals. So I don't know, I'll keep it as seven over 10 for now. And then uh, that's the first to the first power. Why first power? Because we want one success. The chance of failure is one minus seven over 10, 30% chance. So three out of 10 chance for a failure of somebody to approve to the second power. Okay, so, so we haven't understood yet. We've just written what the formula says. What did I get to? It's n minus k, three minus one. Okay, let's kind of see what's going on here. Three choose one is three, and then seven over 10 times nine over 10. I'm sorry, nine over 100, because we're squaring it. Uh, it's going to give you 63 times three, which is 189 over 1,000. And as you know, that's three decimal places, and it gives you answer choice B. Easy peasy, right? No problem. Why does this work? That's the question when you're doing past test review. This is so important. You cannot just get an answer or see how it's done and be done with it and move on. You need to process. You need to understand what's going on. Why does this work? Try to understand the tools that are used by the solution giver, whoever that might be. Okay, so let's think about this. What is this three choose one? Well, if you have, uh, we'll say approve and unapprove is A and U. How many ways can I arrange A and U? I can have, if I have exactly one approve and three unapprove, I have A, U, U. Or I could have U, A, U, or U, U, A. These are how many outcomes? Three. Well, then what's three choose one? I know it's three, but why, what's the one? Choose one of these three outcomes to be approval. Fair enough. We want one approval. We want, obviously, there'll be two non-approvals then. Okay, unapprove. Okay, then if I just take one of these, what is the probability of this exact outcome? Okay, these are the questions you have to ask yourself. You have to explore. I mean, if you have a tutor to guide you through the process, great. But those of you who don't, make sure you're asking these kinds of questions to yourself. Why does this work? Explore tinker. Right, try to understand the inner workings. The chance of this approve right here is seven over 10 times the unapproved would be three over 10. They're independent events, okay? So then times three over 10. Okay, what does that look like? It looks an awful lot like this. And if I was to take this event that the first person approves, the second two don't approve, add this one, add this one, because those are events that you would add. They're separate types of situations that could occur. That is the sum total of exactly what you get here. The reason it works is you're taking one particular outcome, the exact arrangement, AUU, 
giving it a probability of occurring, and then multiplying it by the number of ways those letters could come up, all the different arrangements. Once we get that, once we understand that, we're able to do future problems. We're able to adapt when they throw a curve at you because they're probably not gonna give you all questions based on past content. I'm not sure if you've noticed that by now, but as you advance through the years of the tests, the tests increasingly add a new wrinkle on an old concept. And this is also why I feel one of the best ways to prepare is every past test. Yes, as old as the year 2000. This is from two, it doesn't matter that they're easier. There's foundational pieces of information in here. And if you know how they thought in the past, you will have an inkling of how they're going to think in the future when they add a new twist to this. How does that work? We'll be right back and I'll show you. All right, so now for the second part of this lesson about why we don't want to just memorize but understand. So I, I'm modifying it slightly. I do feel there's times you do need to memorize formulas. You need to know them so you can recall them instantly on a timed test. You only have 75 minutes. If, if you're trying to prove, you know, the area of an equilateral triangle with side length S and you're going like this and you're like, okay, S over two, S root three over two, half uh, the base, which is S over two times the height, S root three over two, S squared root three over four. You just lost 25 seconds or so, right? If you just memorize the end, you're gonna save that time and you need every second if you're gonna advance you know, as many questions as you can on the test. So I, I think more of what's intended is that you don't just memorize, okay? Because you do need to be able to quickly recall pieces of information and I do give memorization tricks in my videos. But the main thing is that's not enough. You can't just know this formula. You should know how to derive it, okay? That way, if in a pinch on a test, you're not able to uh, recall it instantly, you can survive by deriving it right there on the test, okay? So then, uh, how are we gonna do this then? The 2012 AMC 12A problem 11, remember this is the upgraded uh, twist on the binomial probability. I think up to this point, I'd never quite seen a problem like this on any of the AMCs up to this point, meaning 2012. Alex, Mel, and Chelsea, you get it, right? A -M, yeah, AMC, right? That's cute. So they play a game that has six rounds. In each round, there is a single winner and the outcomes of the rounds are independent, okay? So in other words, if somebody wins one round, it doesn't affect who wins the next round. Okay, so for each round, the probability that Alex wins is one half. Okay, so probability of A, one half. Mel, and Mel is twice as likely to win as Chelsea. So then that means that the chance of Mel or Chelsea winning is one half. We could say that one of them is one out of X and the other one is one out of two X. And this one would be Mel, and this one would be Chels, and they're going to equal one half, okay? So now I can make this uh, times what? I guess two over two, add to get three over two X equals one half. Um, I guess multiply, no, I reciprocal both sides, two X over three equals two. Now multiply by the reciprocal of three over two. Three over two over here cancels and leaves you with the X. Um, and then what? Cancel the twos, X is three. Okay, so now we know what X is um, and we can write the probability of Mel, which was originally one over X, right? This is not 21, it's two, I'm changing it. So the probability of Mel is one third and the probability of Chels is one sixth. Verify we didn't, at this point right here, you should be checking your work. I mean, if you haven't lived life long enough, you make a lot of mistakes. Verify really quick. Does it make sense that if Mel is twice as likely, is one third two times one sixth? Two times two sixths, one sixth, yeah, that's right. Feel that because that's gonna tell you you haven't made a mistake yet. It gives you confidence as you move forward through the problem, which is important in my opinion. So now we have what? Twice as likely to win as Chelsea. What is the probability that Alex wins three rounds, Mel wins two, and Chelsea wins one? So what would that look like? Let's just give a random sample, right? If Alex wins three, I will have three A's, two M's, and a C. Huh, so what is the chance of this particular outcome occurring? 
Well, okay, so since a is one half, this is one half to the third. The m's, there's two m's, and I want each m is one third, so I'm gonna have one third to the second power, one third times one third, each round is independent, that means I can multiply. And then c is one sixth. So is this the answer? Well, no, it's not actually. If we think back to the 2000 and, what was it, 8, 2008, 2007, something like that. Um, that test we just did, 2008, I think it was, AMC 10B problem, 17. Then we can think about how that worked. It wasn't just one way it could occur. It was all of the arrangements of one of these outcomes. Now, if we understood how that worked, we know what to do next here, and we know high confidence why we're going to be correct when this is done. So how many ways could this set of letters be arranged? There's a whole bunch of ways you could do it. You could do how many words can you make, which is six factorial over uh, the, two, the three A's is three factorial, two factorial. You can do that. Uh, you could also say, I want six choose three. I'm choosing three what? Three A's. What, what does that do then? Let's say I got six spaces, three, four, five, six. I put an A here, an A here, and an A here, let's say. All right, now, how many spaces remain? Three. How many M's do I want? Two. I can multiply by three choose two. And how do I even know two ways to do this? Not nah, intro to counting and probability helps you understand different ways to think about things. And lastly, we don't need to choose where the C goes. Once I place the M's, the C has to go in the only remaining spot, so we don't need to think about that. So either way you do this, six choose three. Um, does that work, six factorial? This should work, yeah. So six choose three is going to be uh, six factorial over three factorial, three factorial. I'm not gonna write all that. I'm gonna write it as six times five times four over three factorial. There was another three factorial here, it canceled here. I don't usually write that because on my test I don't have time, right? So the three factorial is six, it will cancel, this is 20. There's 20 ways for six choose three to be done. There are three ways for this to be done to get 60. If I had done this in the same way, I would get what? Six times five times four and then divided by uh, two. So this is 30 times four is 120, divided by two is 60, same answer. And again, if you know two ways and you do on the test, you can confirm what you suspect in case you had doubts. Now, I don't have any doubts that these would both work, so I would not have done that, but there are times when I'm not sure of a method I used if it's valid and I'll check it with another method to verify. Yes, during timed conditions. If you're fast enough, you can do that. Um, Okay, so then what do we got? There are 60 ways to arrange these letters. And because we understood binomial probability, this is not two outcomes, it's three possible outcomes. But if you understood how binomial probability was created, then you can apply that here in the exact same way. This will be 60 times this. I'm gonna calculate that's 60 times 1 8th times 1 9th times one sixth. I will cancel the six to get 10. I will cancel a two out of here to get five, a two out of here to get four. I've got a four and a nine left, five over 36. Answer choice B. This is why they say, don't memorize, understand. And I would add to that, don't just memorize, okay? So make sure in your studies as you're preparing, yes, binomial probability should go in your small notebook. If you don't understand what the small notebook's about, there's a video I made explaining fully the small notebook, okay? So this is what you wanna do as you work through past tests. Use the problems as a springboard. When you see a concept in the solutions, use it as a springboard to go and research that topic. Learn other ways to think about it. Learn why it works. Don't just memorize the formula. That's it. We've got about two weeks left, three weeks left. What are we at? Three weeks left, I think. About uh, maybe four weeks. I don't know. Three to four weeks left. I haven't checked. You guys have a good one and uh, best of luck in your studies.